teams. And most of all, a special thanks to our partners that are giving us their precious cargo to be able to del deliver to the International Space Station. You know, as you know, this mission isn't complete. Obviously, launch is a very, very important first step. And so looking forward to getting the crews to the International Space Station. Uh, Dina and the team have a whole lot of work for them to do. <laughs> We're gonna be keeping them super busy over the next six months, a very, very exciting time on the International Space Station. But for right now, we're gonna keep our eyes on the ball and ensure that we bring those crews safely to the International Space Station. And I personally am gonna be very happy to welcome Steve, Woody, Sultan, and Andre to the International Space Station on that welcome ceremony early tomorrow morning. And then hopefully hoping to get some sleep at that point. <laughs> I think we're all kind of hoping to get some sleep after this last week, but uh, what a great launch. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Steve Stitch, Commercial Crew Program Manager. Yeah, thanks Kathy, and it's great to be here. And thanks for the interest to tonight um, in attending the event. Uh, it was a really uh, great launch, really smooth countdown today, as, uh, as Kathy said. and. Uh, really worked really well. Uh, we worked just a few things during the countdown. Uh, first of all, you know, Kathy commented on the, the T-TAB system that we ended up scrubbing the launch for a few days ago. We went in and replaced two filters in that system, and that system performed very nominally uh, tonight, no problem at all. It's a very critical system. Uh, it provides uh, an ignition fluid up to the nine Merlin 1 D en engines, and, and that worked great tonight. Um, early in the count, we had a little issue with the hydraulic system where we ended up swapping out a seal. That was uh, really early before uh, any of the teams got out to the launch pad or we uh, pressed up the rocket. Uh, it was a seal and a hold down system that was replaced and that system functioned really well. Um, overall, I thought the team did a great job tonight working through uh, some minor issues and getting into the count. You know, we watched the weather really carefully for the attempt uh, tonight. In particular, the winds in the staging area were right at the limits, and those held within limits. Our meteorological team, uh, the 45th Space Wing, and the meteorologist in Houston did a great job with the forecasting and gave us a great opportunity to launch tonight. Um, the vehicle, Dragon's on orbit, and it's doing really well. Um, the cooling system's working fine. We opened the nose cone and uh, did a test firing of the four Ford Bulkhead Dracos, and we did a phasing burn with those. That all went nominally. Uh, we did have one issue with uh, the sensor on one of the hooks that's used to hold the nose cone system uh, closed, and I'll let Benji talk about that, but the system operated nominally on the backup and worked just fine, and we'll be able to probably uh, take that sensor out of the system, and we'll have no problems with docking. Um, a huge thanks to the NASA and SpaceX team for working so hard for all these months to get us here. When I reflect back on the four years from demo one to today, uh, how far our teams have come, how strong the partnership is between NASA and SpaceX, how we worked a lot of challenges, and it's just a little hard to believe that we're on our sixth crew rotation mission in, in just four years. Um, the crew on board is doing great. They have got out of their suits. There's a bit of an off-duty time, so the way we're letting them manage the, the time on orbit, on orbit is from about 2 a.m. this morning to uh, 10 p.m. tonight Eastern, they'll have an off-duty period so they can manage when they sleep, when they eat, and then they'll get back into their suits uh, for docking. That approach initiation burn will be at 11.35 p.m. tonight, and then the first contact for docking would be Friday morning at 1.17 a.m. Eastern time. Um, again, the crew's doing great. It's great to see some smiling faces on orbit. We're really excited. We're taking it one step at a time and uh, looking forward to a good docking tomorrow. And I'll turn it over to uh, Dina. All right. Thank you, Steve. And thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, you're, as you all saw that are here in this room, you know, it really was a spectacular launch. And so uh, I know I'm set up the third time around, but it, it was incredible to see. It really was. And I would really would like to also thank and congratulate the teams from SpaceX uh, and Commercial Crew Program and the ISS teams and all the partnership, everybody who's made it a success up to this point. Um, so ISS is doing great and we are definitely looking forward to welcoming this new crew on board. 
Uh, ISS has been a, a really busy place where we had on February 17th, we had a progress Russian cargo vehicle undock from a Zenith port on ISS. And then uh, we um, later on Thursday of last week, we had a Soyuz launch. That's an uncrewed Soyuz and it had a, a successful and nominal automated docking on Saturday night. Uh, so um, that set us up with um, uh, a, a new replacement Soyuz that um, can be used for uh, Dmitry, Sergei, and Frank's return. And so um, you will be planning to move Frank's seat liner. Uh, he has a Soyuz seat liner currently in the Dragon Crew 5 Dragon. And we'll be planning to move that over to, uh, to this new Soyuz uh, here shortly. And so now we're um, excited about Crew 6 and its arrival. And uh, as, as has been said, it'll be Houston time. By the time I fly back, it'll be Houston time, midnight 17, uh, when it comes in docks. And so looking forward to uh, a successful docking. A really busy place. Um, you know, the, um, the next thing that'll happen after that is the Crew 5 departure. And so the crew is gonna spend, uh, the Crew 6 guys are gonna spend quite a bit of time, a few days with the Crew 5 guys, just, you know, getting a handover, uh, really getting the details about how the station operates, you know, its little idiosyncrasies and making sure they have a really good handle on things. And then after Crew 5 departs, very shortly after that, we'll have um, a string of flights. And so it's important that the crew uh, has a good handover. Uh, so this crew, uh, the Crew 6 guys, they're going to be on orbit for six months, and they have a lot of research ahead of them. And so Kathy mentioned uh, we're going to keep them busy. Uh, just some examples of the research. Um, we're going to be doing uh, some exploration type of research uh, to try to further our capabilities when it comes to deep space exploration. We'll be doing experiments to see how materials burn in microgravity, and we'll be doing uh, tissue chip uh, research, which is uh, related to heart and cartilage and brain functions. And, you know, this is uh, a really um, interesting time uh, as well, since we have all of our international partnership and all of their science, uh, and we'll be having uh, some specific science associated with the United Arab Emirates uh, science as well with Sultan on board. So, like I said, keeping them busy, uh, and then just to kind of go through all the, the visiting vehicle traffic that the crew will also see, bringing this science back and forth. Uh, we'll start with SpaceX 27, and that will arrive around mid-March, and then uh, that'll be about a 30-day mission, and uh, then hot on the heels of that, we'll be having the Boeing crewed flight test mission, and we're looking forward to having Sunny and Butch on board. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, we'll also have a, a Northrop Grumman 18-19 exchange. So Northrop Grumman 18 will depart, uh, unberth, and then Northrop Grumman 19 will launch. And then uh, we'll have the uh, next, the second um, private astronaut mission, that's Axiom 2. And then we'll have, uh, soon after that, SpaceX 28, which is bringing, in addition to a bunch of science, we'll also be bringing the next set of solar arrays uh, for, for our station upgrades. So we have a lot in store for the Crew 6 guys. Um, we're definitely looking forward to seeing them on board. Uh, and again, I'm really proud of this team and uh, looking forward to uh, what, what comes next. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Benji. Great, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thank you um, everyone. and. Um, here uh, uh, at Kennedy and, and across the nation and world who are uh, paying attention to these launches. I think it's uh, so important for all of us to remember. Kathy mentioned uh, the conjunction of the planets and looking up at the stars, and we don't, we don't do that enough. Even those of us who are in the business, it's important to think that this is where we're going. This is where those four astronauts are headed right now, and to join a number of other astronauts who are already there you know, that much closer to the stars and the planets where we all want to go to and why we drive for this exploration and ultimately making our lives multiplanetary. Um, and it's a sacred honor. I've, uh, I've sat in this seat before and we've said those words and every single time, that's the truth, right? This is a sacred honor that we all share in um, carrying these um, people's lives to space and bringing them back home to their families. And uh, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, as, uh, as mentioned already, the, uh, the crew is uh, safely on their way uh, to a space station. We had a, a, a good launch, overall a very clean count, as we say, um, and uh, good staging. And we got uh, Dragon into a nominal orbit, and uh, they're off and running. Um, it's also important to note, though, that that is just the first step um, in the process, right? They need to get to station and get docked and then, uh, and then do their work 
that uh, Dean has got set up for them, and, and then uh, in six months we need to bring them home safely. And speaking of bringing people home, um, not to forget that you know right on the heels here of this launch, um, we'll be bringing home Crew 5, and we've talked a little bit about that already, um, but it's, uh, it's also a, a critical activity and a critical operation that we're paying close attention to as we get ready to bring um, those guys home after their, uh, all of their hard work on station back to their families. Uh, so that's uh, um, an, another thing that we put a lot of attention on. Um, I wanted to address, let's see, a couple of the issues that we talked about um, already. Um, so there was the, uh, the T-TEB issue that, uh, where we scrubbed our launch on Sunday night. And I'll kind of go into a little bit of detail, so bear with me. Um, and I'll drone on just a little bit about that. But um, TTEB is a triethyl aluminum triethyl boron. It's um, essentially a, uh, a chemical that uh, you know it kind of instantaneously combusts when it gets into the air. Um, you think of it as a way of just a very quickly lighting the match that's going to light your oxidizer and your fuel, in this case kerosene and liquid oxygen. So as a rocket works, I'm going to be a little bit basic probably for a lot of this audience, but in case you're sending out to your readers, I'll, I'll add, I'll put this in. But fundamentally, you've got kerosene, you've got liquid oxygen, you've got to mix them together, and you want them to, you want that to igniting of igniting those engines. The way that we do that is with this, this stuff called TTEB, um, and uh, we flow to make sure that there's enough of this TTEB going into the engines when it's time to ignite them. We flow it up to the interface of the rocket, up to the interface of the engines, um, and to basically get all the gas out of the system. It's sort of like when you, if you replace your brakes and you have to, um, you know, bleed the brake line system to make sure you've got all the air bubbles out of the, out of the lines, you want to make sure you just have brake fluid. It's the same idea. We want to bleed the line so that we have any gas out of that system, and we, we're sure we're going to have exactly enough TTEB, the correct amount of TTEB, to ignite the engines right when it's time. Um, so during the count on Sunday night, we were um, watching as we do all of the different data, all the different signatures of information as we call them, as we call them, coming in um, from the rocket and the systems and the ground systems. And one piece of data looked a little bit funny, one of the signatures looked a little funny, which was how much TTEB is coming back into the catch tank, so coming out. So when you're bleeding in the TTEB to the rocket interface, you're, you're pushing the air out there or the gas out, but you also want to um, make you're, you're bringing the TTEB back to a catch tank, and you want to see how much you're catching in that tank on, your con on the way out. And we weren't getting clear data that we were getting the, what we would expect to see, the amount of TTEB coming into that tank. And that gave us pause for concern. Um, at that point, the count that was within an hour, but still we had most of that hour to go. Um, we had a very clean board, overall clean count. Um, you know, uh, the teams weren't working other issues of anything significant. And so we were looking at, we said, well, we can go ahead and work this issue and under, try to understand it a little bit better. Um, and, uh, and so they did that, all of the engineers um, in the back rooms as well as um, the key operators were, were looking at that and assessing, okay, is, are we okay? Are we really, are we sure that we're not getting enough TTEB into that uh, catch tank or not? Um, at the end of the day, we couldn't be absolutely sure that we had enough TTEB, enough of this ignition fluid bled up to the interface of the rocket to make sure that we would get that consistent, exactly timed ignition that we need across all nine engines. So we scrubbed the launch because we need to make sure that we have that in place. Um, then in the, in the interim, so after we scrubbed launch, um, we, we got into the system and we discovered that there was a filter that was clogged. Um, and just like most fluid systems that you have in your house or your car or in rockets and ground systems, you've got filters. And um, this, uh, this particular filter was clogged and that's why we weren't getting enough TTEB into the catch tank. Um, Looking back so far at the data that we have seen so far as we continue to look into this, um, probably there was enough TTEB to be able to launch safely. Um, I think it probably would have been just fine. But that's not, what we, that's not how we launch people. We launch people when we know for sure that it's going to be okay, that everything's going to go nominally the way we expect. Um, and so with that in mind, um, we, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we, we, we delayed the launch. We changed out the filter. Um, and then we also put in place some additional checks in, the, in our process and our procedures to, be, to get better information at, um, for future launches as well. Um, and uh, tonight it worked very well. Um, TTEB blooded exactly as expected. 
We caught the amount that we needed to see in the catch tanks. All the other data signatures looked great. And obviously, as we saw, and everybody's mentioned the beautiful launch tonight, um, it was uh, the, all nine engines ignited just the way they were supposed to and got the uh, crew safely to orbit. Uh, that was the TTAB issue, and I will now talk about the Dragon hooks on the Dragon nose cone. So the way that works is um, you've got the, the, the capsule, and there's actually 12 hooks in that system. Only six of those hooks are used to hold down um, the, the nose cone. All 12 hooks are used when you go to space station to dock to station. So the same hooks that are holding down the nose cone are, are six of those hooks plus another six that are not used for the nose cone. 12 are used to grab and pull you in to do hard docking into station. Um, just want to give you a sense of what this, how this system works. And then again, when you leave station, you got to close the nose cone and you want to relatch the nose cone. The six that are for the nose cone are used to pull the nose cone uh, tightly closed and hold it closed. Um, tonight what we saw, oh, let me back up again. On the system, each of the hooks has three different sensors, basically limit uh, switches, that, that a combination of the information given from the three limit switches on all 12 hooks tells you the status of where you're at. Are we all the way closed? Are we all the way open? Are we, in, are we moving through that opening process? One of those 36 limit switches um, was not indicating correctly. It was, not indi it, was, it was indicating that we weren't opening, something was not right, it was not matching fundamentally what all the other limit switches were saying. Um, the system, out of an abundance of caution, when it sees something funny in that data set, it moves all of the switches, I'm mean, sorry, all of the hooks over to the redundant motor windings. And this is a really interesting subtlety, right? They, the motors are actually, it's all the same motors, there's just different windings, different wiring in each motor set. We moved over to their backup winding set, worked just perfectly. Everything's fine, and the dragon nose cone opened. What we've done since that time um, is we um, assessed whether or not, we, so we're, we're, we're pretty confident, hey, it's just this one limit switch is off. Um, and what we've done is we've assessed all of the rules and you know all the, the what if situations and you kind of go through this whole process. And we said, okay, we don't think we need to, we most likely, and we're gonna go through the process correctly, um, you know, through tonight we'll talk with Steve's team. But we believe we'll be able to just ignore the data from that one out of 36 erroneous limit switch in order to go ahead and continue to function on the primary windings and we'll also still have the backup windings and we'll have all the other limit switches. So at this point in time, we don't foresee any issue and we see no elevated risk to the crew for docking or for after six months when it comes time to close that nose cone again. Um, I think that was it, I think you covered other stuff and I'm sure there'll be some questions so we can answer those as well. Um, anyway, so after that, with all of those issues aside, I just, the last thing I wanna say is, um, it is really cool to be part of this team. It's really neat to be up here with some of uh, my great colleagues and friends that we've been here for a long time. Um, folks that you know I'm working more newly with um, and partners who have joined us um, since all of these wild missions that we've been doing what, like, it's, it's basically four years and exactly to the day and hour, minus, I think, four hours. So, like, to, since we launched Demo 1, or two hours, I'm getting a motion from the back. So, almost to the day and hour since we launched Demo 1, we just launched Crew 6. And that is so cool. And we couldn't do that without this partnership with NASA. Um, we couldn't do it without um, the partnership with the 45th Space Wing. We couldn't do this with the dedication from the SpaceX teams and all of their families, from the NASA teams and all of their families. And we couldn't do that without the dedication of our partners um, and Roscosmos um, and, of course, the UAE. And uh, one of our newest and, and, and very excited partners, exciting to have on board. So with that, um, Salim. Thank you, uh, Benji. Uh, uh, good, good morning, everybody, and uh, honestly, I think it was also, uh, I'd like to echo what everybody said. It was a beautiful launch. I think it was a gorgeous launch, and for us, I think, uh, made all uh, the sweeter because we had an Emirati on board, and, you know, that's not something that uh, uh, happens very often, so 
Uh, for that, I'd like to thank our partners in NASA, NASA leadership, for all your support and effort over the years. Uh, we've, we've got a very strong partnership. Uh, we have four astronauts training at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Uh, and this type of partnership and, and long duration flight is something that we value very much. So thank you for that. I'd also like to thank uh, SpaceX, Benji and your team uh, for all the dedication that uh, SpaceX that we've seen over the years and what we've seen uh, throughout this launch campaign as well that your team's put in. Uh, really this, uh, this type of partnership and, and the way the results are very clear is something that we value and envy as well. So thank you very much uh, to both these teams. Uh, for us, uh, as I mentioned, this is our second flight. So we had a short duration uh, Soyuz flight in 2019 uh, with Hazza al Mansouri, who went to the ISS for about eight days. And we learned a lot from that flight. And we saw the whole country was tuned in. And then uh, we have a long term strategy of wanting to be a, a player in human spaceflight because we see the importance of human spaceflight. We want human spaceflight to be in the region. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot of active human spaceflight in the Arab region, and we think uh, that needs to change. Uh, and with this second flight and a long duration flight, it's uh, making history for us in the region. I think we'll be the 10th or 11th country that uh, uh, does a long term uh, spaceflight to the ISS. And I think that sends a clear message that uh, we are here to be active players and we are here to stay. So we can only do that with partnerships. And we look forward to uh, a successful docking and a very successful mission and to future missions. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for those opening remarks. It's time now for questions. Remember, if you're on the phone, star one will get you into the question queue. Please keep it to one question and let us know who you want to answer that question. We'll start here in the room in the front row, please. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Uh, Benji, I'd like to follow up on the TTEB issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of you you had this before, and wh why did these filters clog, and what are you going to do pre-flight in the future to make sure that they're not clogged again, causing a, a problem? Thanks. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so TTEB is, is a, a long-standing, you know, across the industry used for these types of engines for as an ignition fluid. Um, and we've been using TTEB um, for our rockets for F9. Um, so it, the, the specific issue that we've seen with this clogged filter is, is was new. Um, we actually have a regular maintenance uh, uh, schedule, just like changing out your oil and the oil filter, we do the same thing. We regularly change out the filters in the TTEB system. Um, in this case, um, what, we're, what we think has probably happened is we'd actually changed out the fluid and, um, and we may have introduced a little bit of air into that system um, that basically allowed for more oxidation to occur. So the mixture of the, of the fluid with the, with the possibly little bit of introduction of air caused more oxidation. Um, it, that's what it appeared to be that we were catching in the, in the filter was just more um, essentially oxidate, oxidized material from the system itself um, in the filter. So we expect now to um, have that cleaned out that that's done and, and clean. We don't expect to see that anymore. Um, we'll continue to inspect the systems thoroughly. Now that we know that this can happen, we will continue to change out filters regularly. And um, as I mentioned, there's just more data signatures and more things we can look at as we are you know, going through all of our operations and we go into counts to uh, have a better sense of where things are at. Yeah. Take another question from the front row. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. I think this is probably for Steve Stitch and or Benji. I think this was your last launch under your original commercial crew contract. I know it's not over till the crew is back when that contract is fulfilled. But I was wondering if you could take a step back and reflect. You talked a little bit about this being, you know, so many missions since the demo one. But just as you transitioned to, into those extension missions, do you feel like you're in a rhythm? Does it feel routine at this point? And uh, for Steve Stitch, are you planning on adding more missions to Boeing's contract beyond their six? Thanks. Yeah, look, maybe maybe I'll start and then Benji can add. Uh, yeah, of course we added flights already to the SpaceX contract. Uh, we added eight more flights and we have activated uh, three of those flights already. So so I have those on uh, ATP'd in, in, in contract. I mean, 
when you asked, is it routine now? I think we're in a rhythm of getting into these flights. Some parts of it are much more uh, predictable as we get into the flight readiness process. Uh, going through the vehicle readiness, I think that we're in a good routine uh, between NASA and SpaceX. But every single flight that we get into the countdown of, there's a little bit of a difference in the Dragon configuration, a little difference in the pad, a little difference in Falcon 9, something going on with the fleet that we have to monitor. So it never is easy and it's never really routine. They're each different. They each have their challenges. And what's exciting to me is uh, the way the team works through those challenges every single flight, whether it be a structural problem or, or a pad problem or whatever, I think we, we do a great job of working through those uh, together. Uh, you know, relative to Boeing, we're working really hard to get to uh, the crewed flight test uh, very soon. Um, and we already have six flights uh, for Boeing on contract and we'll We'll look out there as we get work toward the end of the, the space station program in that 2030 time frame and see if we need to add more flights uh, at a later time. So, and uh, I'll just I'll just add that it's uh, we, it's just an awesome time in space flight. And so when you look back at the um, the opportunity that we've had to be able to provide these you know six month rotational missions is great. It wasn't what we originally planned to do necessarily, but we're happy to do it. Um, and um, and it's certainly exciting, but we also are excited to see so many other players hopefully coming onto the scene in all the different, you know, areas of, of, of going to space, whether it's in launch or space capsules or going to the moon or building, you know, LEO habitats or all of these things. If we're going to open the space age, we're going to make life multiplanetary, it has to have a big ecosystem with a lot of people doing things. And I mean, that goes back again, we're talking about our new partners like, uh, you know the United Arab Emirates. It's 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 so cool to have these kind of partners, and the ongoing international partnership, the International Space Station, right, um, with all of the players, ESA and Canada and JAXA and and um, in Roscosmos. Like this is this is part of what we're trying to do globally, and and so I I, I think you look at it in the context of 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 how it all comes together, and then for us, you know. Um, we look forward to more and more flights of different kinds, you know, hopefully with lots of different partners who are, you know, we're not necessarily just going to the ISS, but we've got other things we can go do. There's so much to do in space. Great, thank you. We'll now move to a question on the phone from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, another question for Benji, if, you, if I could. Um, First of all, is, is there any update on Starship for us on when we might see the, the big guy fly down in Boca Chica? Um, and, and driving in every night, you know, we always pass by the SpaceX facility on the on the highway and see those big uh, gantry segments. Can you give us some sense of uh, where those guys are going, what they're for, and when? Thanks. Um, okay, okay, so I, sorry, I was just thinking about, I'm trying to think about what segments you're seeing, but I'll, I think I probably have a good good idea about what the question is. Um, so overall, um, obviously we're here to talk about crew. I'll always say that first, because that's what we are here to talk about. Um, but, um, but you know, Starship is an exciting part of uh, where we're headed, and it's an exciting part of our partnership with NASA, um, certainly. Um, and uh, you probably all saw that we had the big uh, the static fire that we did on the Starship. And um, that's a, a very important milestone in the step towards our, uh, our first flight. And um, I personally, just from my own sense of being, having been in the business for a while and, and being at SpaceX for a while, this, it feels, we're feeling very convergent. That's the word I like to use. It feels like we're converging. So I, I feel good about where we're headed and I'm excited to see, I'm excited to see where we're headed um, on that. And, and um, uh, there's a lot of great work going on down here at uh, KSC. Uh, Kennedy is an awesome partner. Um, you know, uh, all the centers that we get to work with in NASA are really awesome partners of ours, and we get to uh, have a, we have a lot going on down here, and uh, so uh, it's uh, it, it's it's good to see. You'll always see lots of interesting things when you drive by. Thank you. We'll now take another question from the phone with Zach Aubert from the Launchpad News. Yes. Good morning, Zach Aubert, Launchpad News, TLP Network. For Benji, looking back at. Monday scrub with the TTEB issue. Um, of course, safety is the number one priority, but if this had been a regular Starlink or cargo flight, would you have still stood down from the launch or 
was this scrub specifically because it was a crewed mission and wondering if there's any update on the dragon xl vehicle uh and the contracts with nasa and i'm not sure who from nasa it would be but will there ever be a possibility of a photo of the soyuz seat liner inside dragon being able to be released because i know a number of us are wondering what that looks like thank you i actually forgot the first question <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, it, it, yes. oh, we have scrub. scrub. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was, I was like, I haven't seen any pictures, so I don't think. But <laughs> um, so, if we uh, would we have scrub? Look, you know what? The call on Sunday night was the right call, right? That was the right thing to do because we didn't have the data to go fly the mission that we were in. And every mission that you're in, you have to make that call. I don't, I don't think you can go back and kind of armchair quarterback the thing and say, oh, well, what have I done something different or what have I done in a different situation? Like the situation you're in is a real-time operational situation. So you have to make the right call in that situation. That's what I think we did. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm very proud of the teams, the joint teams, in how they, how they went through that. And I'll add to that. I mean, I was a part of the operation and kind of watched it, you know, I've, seen some shuttle countdowns where we had to we had problems we worked uh, down late and had to scrub and basically the team couldn't get comfortable that they had the right amount of t-tap up into the engines to start the rocket and it's a very critical fluid as benji talked about and so the, the team decided hey it's not a good day to go fly this is very far out of family with what they've had and the hundreds of launches they've had in the past and they stood down, and I suspect the same thing probably would have happened on a non-NASA flight for SpaceX. Relative to the seat liner picture, I don't know where we're at. I Maybe we I, can, I we can go. We'll think have to we talk could to go Roscosmos talk to Roscosmos about releasing that would be acceptable, something. and then discuss it with SpaceX. So um, let us look into that. <coughs> Do we have another question in the room? Right on the front room. Starting tomorrow morning after 1 a.m. I'm, I'm sorry, Phil Keating, Fox News. So once this crew arrives, how many people will be on board the station? It'll be a total, of, is that a record? No, not a record. Okay, no. and then three come back? Four. Oh, four, 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 four. four. yeah, mm -hmm. the crew five, uh, four astronauts come back on crew five. Are they coming back on a Dragon? Dragon, yeah. It, okay. That vehicle is a Dragon uh, capsule and it's been there since we launched last October and we'll look at the weather after we get docked, uh, after we get crew six docked, we'll start looking at the weather. First undock opportunity would be probably March 8th or 9th in that time frame. So. And a quick follow up on the T-TAB, had you, you kept going and not scrubbed and the levels of the ignition fluid were lower than what you want, what could have happened? I mean, could it have been disastrous or could it have possibly just still succeeded i think what probably could have happened I, I think we convinced ourselves even after looking at the data that we probably would have been safe the engines probably would have started nominally just fine i think what would have likely happened had we not quite had enough is the engines probably would have aborted and we would have not lifted off so there's there's protection in there there's the, the engines look for certain pressures over a certain time once the start command is sent to the engine and so I suspect the system would have uh, aborted out and, and shut the engines down safely or not started them at all. So. Thank you. All right, we have another question on the phone. Uh, we'll go to Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online. And I guess is for Benji and Steve. And I'm just curious about how you look at these anomalous situations and make a decision on how to move forward. So on TTEB, you had a reading that was unusual. You weren't quite sure what it was telling you, and you decided to scrub the launch. But on the hooks, you're having a reading that's anomalous. You're not quite sure what it is, but you've decided that in this case, it's probably a sensor problem, and you don't need to worry about it. I'm just curious how you go through that decision analysis. Let, let, me, let me start, and then I'll see if, uh, if Benji has anything to add. So. I would say the two problems are a little bit different, and, and let me go through it. The TTAP system, obviously it's a fluid that we need to get up into the engine to start it, and there, there really is uh, 
no redundancy in that fluid. There's one line that comes up into each engine that provides that TTAB. Um, and when we looked at the data, again, as Benji described, this fluid is moving up into a line and then going into the engine and then running out into a tank. And we can see the quantity in that tank is not uh, at the level it typically is. And so it gave us great pause to go uh, that we would, might not have enough TTAB into the engines to start. On the hook problem that Benji described, what we have there is a sensor that uh, is either not functioning correctly or it's indeterminate. And as ben Benji said on that hook number five, there's three other sensors, right? So in space, it's designed to have some redundancy and, and it worked just fine and went to the backup system. And so these are little micro switches and I suspect we might see it come back. I, my experience in space shuttle is sometimes they come back and so it's a really different problem. Once one system has a lot of redundancy in it and multiple sensors in the T-tab, it really was just, you know, the T-tab going into the engine that we needed to have to start. And so totally different system. And in one case, we're proceeding on. Obviously, the nose cone opened just fine. Likely, the system's going to perform just fine at docking. We'll take that one sensor out. As Benji said, there's 36 other sensors. So it's a little bit different situation. Great, thank you. We do have another question on the phone uh, from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Um, yeah, hi, uh, for, for Steve Stitch, if I could, could or, or maybe it's for Dina. Do you guys have date shifts for Crew 5? I mean, I, I was here in uh, March the 9th, but I wasn't sure about uh, when splash time might occur. And by the way, you guys, uh, the demo, demo 1 mission was my birthday, and now you've done it again. So I want to thank you very much for the candles. Happy birthday. Uh, yeah, well, we've been talking about a five-day handover or so, so, um, you know, shooting for about the ninth, but we'll be looking at weather and, um, you know, could, anyway, we're, we're taking a look at that right now. And happy birthday, Bill. Happy birthday. We'll go back to the room. Steve Clark. Hi, Steve Clark, Space Fly Now again. Uh, I think a couple of questions for Benji. Just to follow up on Bill's earlier question about the uh, tower segments outside of uh, Hangar X off on Roberts Road, are, are those for commercial crew cargo going to Slick 40 or are those for something else? Uh, we've seen some work going on out there when we're driving in. Just wondering what those are for, basically. I think that was the gist of his question. And uh, if you could walk through kind of the order of your missions for Dragon going through the rest of this calendar year, like what's, what's the sequence that you're planning going through uh, 2023? Sure, absolutely. Um, so uh, let's see, in terms of the tower, there are the segments. I actually, I haven't seen the specific segments myself, so I can't, I can't speak to that to tell you what those are. Um, but I can tell you that we are looking forward to uh, bringing up uh, Dragon launch capability from uh, Pad 40 again. Uh, and I say again, because maybe a lot of us don't remember, a lot of folks don't remember, we, that's where we originally launched Dragon from the, in the early cargo days. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to have that brought up uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, it'll probably focus first on um, cargo missions, but it'll also be an excellent backup um, capability um, for uh, human missions as well, for crew missions as well. So having that redundancy is, is really important um, for, uh, for you know, the ISS and just in general. Um, and then, um, um, and it just it, it creates more flexibility. Um, uh, and then the other, the other question again, give me that again, sorry. Just walk through uh, the Dragon Oh, the Dragon, the dragon Manifest, yes. So, uh, yeah, well, I think actually uh, Dina kind of talked through it already. It's pretty, pretty well, right? So we've got, a, we've got a cargo launch coming up um, right away, um, and then we'll have um, uh, Axiom 2, um, a private astronaut mission to the space station, um, another cargo launch, um, and we'll also have the uh, Crew 7 launch. Um, looking forward to that um, it, uh, later in the year. And then another cargo launch as well. Um, so a lot of uh, crew and cargo missions coming up um, and um, to space station. And um, not to forget, we also have our Polaris Dawn mission that'll be coming up um, in the summer. Um, and that'll be a free flyer mission, not to station. Um, but that, is that before Crew 7 or is it later in the year? I would guess so, yes. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. All right. We'll take another question in the room. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Um, my question for Steve or Kathy, probably. What is the future of uh, 
of uh, crew swaps with uh, Ross Cosmos. You have an agreement now, I think it was for two or three. This is the second one. So what, what's happening beyond that? Uh, well, how are the good negotiations going? And, and what's the future of astronaut flights uh, for the UAE? Thanks. So um, we, we currently have an agreement with Roscosmos for one crew rotation mission a year on SpaceX. We're actually in the process of updating that to add the Crew 7 mission this fall and working that through the um, Russian government and then back through obviously our side of um, and to get final agreement but um, that's our that's our goal is to get is to be able to then support um, integrated crews and we've talked a lot I know you guys have heard from us a lot about why we feel like integrated crews are important for us to maintain the best logistic support to the ISS and so um, with the addition of the Crew 7 agreement, we would have coverage for Crew 7 and Crew 8. And eventually at, at some point when we have gone through uh, our crewed flight test with Boeing and an initial P PCM-1 test, our PCM-1 mission, um, we would be looking at also adding Boeing to an integrated crew agreement. We would like to continue that every single crew rotation mission has integrated crew on it to make sure that we have at least one USOS and one uh, Roscosmos cosmonaut on it to ensure that we've got coverage for both sides of the segment on every single vehicle. Yes, uh, so I think uh, firstly, uh, you know, we have uh, our attention firmly focused on this mission. Uh, of course, looking at the future, you know, we have four astronauts who are trained or training currently at NASA. And our objectives are to fly them. Uh, we are, of course, looking at uh, short duration missions and long duration missions uh, and beyond that. So this is uh, what we plan to do, of course. Now, uh, as a relatively small country and a new entrant in human space flight, I would expect us to look at a flight uh, every three to five years, something like that. So, as I said, you know, we're focused on this mission currently and possibly one in the three to five years, as we said. All right, we have another question on the phone from Zach Aubert from the Launchpad News. Yeah, thanks for coming around to me again. Benji, looking at a future with commercial crew on Lunar Gateway, SpaceX has a contract for cargo missions. Last week, Mark Wise sort of suggested that SpaceX may be able to execute the first mission more quickly than the four-year lead time in the contract. I was wondering if there was any update on how this contract's proceeding with NASA, and is Dragon XL still part of the plan? Thank you. You know, I, I really appreciate the question, but I think we should stay focused on Crew-6 mm -hmm. and uh, our crew missions at the space station. Thank you, though. Do we have any other questions in the room? All right, that brings us to the end of this news conference. Thank you to all who participated. You can follow along with Crew-6's entire ride to the space station by checking out NASA's mission audio live feed on YouTube. There you can listen to real-time audio between the crew and the ground. Then coverage here on NASA TV and NASA's social media accounts will resume later today at 11.30 p.m. Eastern time for docking to the International Space Station about two hours later at 1.17 a.m. Friday. Thank you for watching. We leave you now with a recap of Crew-6's launch. 15 seconds. Ready for an on-time launch for the instantaneous 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engines full power and lift off the crew six. Go Dragon, go Falcon. Now launching on Endeavour's fourth flight to the International Space Station. Vehicles pitching down range. 1.7 million pounds of thrust provided by the nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage. Hearing good calls, stage one propulsion is nominal.